Hello, my name is Robert Boningheimer. I've been using Fiddler for a very long time. I use it daily to do web troubleshooting. There's a lot of great features in it, but in this particular video, I want to focus on the autoresponder and show you some good practical uses of that particular feature. It's important to understand how Fiddler works. So Fiddler is a proxy that sits between the client and the server. So when I start Fiddler, it's going to change my Windows configuration information and tell modern browsers that when they are open and they're doing HTTP or HTTPS traffic, I want to route it to the local host and port 8888 by default. That's where Fiddler will be running. So it's going to route the requests from the client that are going to the server through Fiddler. Fiddler can do a lot of things. It can just simply trace the network traffic. It can actually make changes to that traffic as it's going back and forth. Again, we're going to talk about autoresponder. So the first thing I'm going to do is request the web page. And if we go back to Fiddler, we'll see that these are the requests that were made for that web page. So the page is just a fictional travel site. We can see that it's made a number of requests for CSS, JavaScript, and JPEG files. Now what we want to do to be able to simulate this and serve these requests from my local client. I've got the autoresponder tab open on the right. I'm going to take the request for the HTM page and drag it over so that autoresponder will create a rule. So I've got a basic rule set up. I also want to save off all of the requests that were made. So I'm going to go to File, Export Sessions, All Sessions. What I want to do is I want to export all of the files that were captured between the client and the server. So I'm going to capture the raw files. I'm going to export them to my desktop and I'm asking it to recreate the folder structure. So you can see here that we've got a CSS subfolder and images and a JS for JavaScript. I want the folder on my desktop to represent that same file structure. I'm also choosing to skip the non uh, 200 responses. So you can see I don't happen to have a favorite icon, so I'm just not going to export that. When I hit export now, it has taken those responses and actually saved all of the files onto my desktop. So let's look at what that looks like. So we can see here it's exported a folder. I'm going to open that up. And here I can see I've got all the files that were requested. If we look, I've got the images, I've got the JavaScript, I've got the CSS. To make my rules a little simpler, I'm going to create a folder called demo, and I'm just going to copy those files over to the demo folder. And then we'll just clean up the other folder that was created. So in the demo folder now, everything that was captured between the client and the server when I asked for that page, all of those files are now stored in that demo folder. Now what I want to do is make a change to this rule. So you can see it's got looking for an exact match. I happen to be running this site on IIS on port 83 on my laptop. That's what the match is on top. But instead of returning a 200, I'm going to ask it to find a file. And we'll go out to the desktop into the demo folder. And I'm going to pick the HTM file. So that happened to be the first request in that session. So it named it one underscore HTM. So I'm going to choose that file. I'm going to pick Enable Rules. So now when I do that, anytime a request comes through, it's going to look at the rules I have in Autoresponder, look for a match. If it finds a match, it's going to return it. So again, if it sees another request for localhost port 83, it's going to return that file that's on my desktop rather than go to the actual website. In this case, I often will have unmatched requests pass through. That just means anything I don't have a rule matching for will actually still make the request out to the actual web server. Just to see that this is actually serving and the rule is working properly, let's go out and modify that page and change the title and show that we are actually using autoresponder at this point. We'll go in the demo folder. We'll just open that file. And we'll just make a quick modification here. We'll, I'll just add my initials so we can see. I'm going to save that. Now if we go back into the browser 
and re-request that page, you'll see that today it just says Sydney. If I do Control F5, now you can see that it's actually pulled the, even though it made a request to localhost port 83, instead of going to the web server, Fiddler has intercepted it, matched a rule, and returned the local copy that's on my desktop. So let's see how we get the rest of the files to come. So now what I want to do is I want to match, I want to add a rule that matches the rest of the requests. So I'm going to hit Add Rule. And in this case, I'm going to make some modifications. I'm going to use regular expressions. So I can say regex. And what I want to do now is I'm going to match on the remainder of the request. So here, I'm going to set up a named group for a regular expression. So the question mark path, is whatever matches next, it's going to store into that path name. So now I'm just going to do a dot star. That means I want to capture anything on the remainder of the URL and store it into the path. Then I can specify where I want the responses to come from. So in this case, I want to fill in the rest of the file to use based on what was matched in the original request. So I say dollar $path. So again, if we look at the rule, I'm saying anything that comes for localhost colon 83 that has something on the rest of its path, I want you to serve from that demo folder using that same path location. So I'm going to hit save with this. Now if we go back, we'll make the request in the browser again. And visually it looks like everything is working fine. To validate that the actual files are being served, I'm going to actually turn off my IIS website just to show that not having the web server present, I'm actually able to serve all of the files locally. So in IIS Manager, I'm just going to go to the individual site. And in this case, I'm going to say Stop. Just to prove that now it wouldn't be working without Fiddler, let's turn those rules off. So if I disable the rules, autoresponder is no longer functioning. Let's hit Control F5. And we'll see that it's clocking because it's not able to actually reach the web server because I've got it shut off. Now if I go back into Fiddler, let's re-enable those rules and make that request again in the browser. I'm going to hit Control F5 and we'll see that it's served and again we saw that we modified the title so we're able to show that that's all coming from the local disk. So again, just an easy example of where I may want to serve files from my local machine. I may want to modify them. Because Fiddler is a proxy sitting between the client and the server, it's intercepting all of those requests and serving those locally off my disk. So again, if I had a really important demo that I knew needed to work properly, I could save off all the files ahead of time. I could do the demo as normal. If I was experiencing any problems during the time, I could actually open up Fiddler enable the rules that I already had set up, everything would serve locally, and it would look like everything was running as expected. So that's our first cool feature with autoresponder and Fiddler. Our next example will be somewhat similar, where we want to have a particular request, and we want to modify just that single response. If all I need to do is that, there's a really simple way to do that. So let's request the web page again. Now that the page has been requested, we'll go back into Fiddler. And here what I can do is I can right click on the request for the web page itself and say unlock for editing. When I do that, I can go to the inspectors. Now I happen to use compression for everything, so I'm going to take the compression off. I can simply make a modification. Let's just add Fiddler on here so it's obvious that's where it's coming from. If I right click again, take off the unlock for editing, I can go to the autoresponder tab I drag that request over. Now when I go back to the browser and make the request, it's going to see that rule and it's going to intercept with the modified response. I hit Control F5 to do a forced refresh. And as you can see, it did what we expected. It added the fiddler into the title. So again, a really easy way. I didn't have to save the file off to disk and do a rule like I did before. If I only mod want to modify a single response, I can do that by just unlock for editing, directly change it, again, put it into autoresponder, and it will return that response when that same request is made. 
While I'm developing this page, it's important for me to understand the impact if any of the JavaScript files I have listed here end up taking a long time to download. I want to know how that impacts the rendering of my content and what options I have and how could I simulate that so I could test it and see what that behavior would look like. So by default, I'm including these three JavaScript files. Each one of them actually writes out to the console so I can see what order they actually execute in, which will become important later. Let's see by default how Chrome looks and how this executes. As I make a request for that page, we'll see that the content displayed immediately and it ran in the order 1, 2, 3 as expected based on the source order in the HTML. What I want to see is now if those JavaScript files are delayed, what kind of impact does that have on the content rendering and what kind of options do I have to deal with that situation? Back in Fiddler, I can drag each of the requests over to the autoresponder. And in this case, I'm going to add some artificial delays so I can see what kind of impact that will have. Now these are in milliseconds. I'm going to make the first script take eight seconds, the next one take four seconds, and the last one, let's put four seconds for that. And for the last one, we'll have it take six seconds. So the first thing we want to see is now that we have some delays, those JavaScript files might be pulling from various sources on the internet. If they were delayed for some reason, what kind of impact does that have on the user for my web page? As those are delayed, what happens to the rendering experience? So let's go back to Chrome. We'll request that page again. And we'll see now with the delay to the JavaScript, things are not executing. We're not seeing things in console yet, but all the content was blocked. So that's really important because now we understand that a slow JavaScript file, the way I'm including it near the top of the page before the content, although they're being downloaded in the background, the browser's choosing not to show any of the content until those JavaScript files are down and executed. If we go back to the actual page, there's a newer feature that we can take advantage of called async. If I add an async attribute to each of these JavaScript files, I'm claiming that these are not important for the rendering. So I want that download to happen in the background and not delay the actual content rendering experience. Let's go back and see how Chrome's going to behave in this case. I've cleared my cache, so we'll make that request again. The important thing you notice, the content is rendered immediately, even though I'm still waiting for JavaScript files. And you'll see that with async, it's now run in a different order, two, three, then one. So with async, I'm saying, download them in the background, execute each of them as soon as they're available. And since I added various delays, we can see that two finish first, then three, then one, which is fine. If the JavaScript files are not dependent on each other, this allows me to get the files and execute them as quickly as possible, most importantly not making my user wait for the rendering to be complete. Back to the web page, if the order does matter, if these JavaScript files are dependent on each other, I can also take advantage of a feature called defer. When I add that attribute, what I'm claiming is you cannot hold up rendering, but we want to execute these in the order that they are listed in source order. So let's look at how that looks now in Chrome. So after clearing my cache, we'll make that request again. Again, the important thing, the content rendered right away. And we'll see now they'll execute in the order they are listed in source order. So we're waiting for the longest one to finish, which was one. And now they execute one, two, and three. So again, the important thing here isn't the fact that we have async and defer. The point is that we can take advantage of Fiddler's autoresponder capability to simulate slowness and be able to see how our page is going to respond. And therefore, we can change our programming techniques to better respond to those potential delays. Another thing we might want to simulate is the ability to see how our page is going to respond if an error occurs requesting a given resource. If you're familiar with CDN, Content Delivery Networks, the idea is they have servers that are spread all across the world that are closer to my end users 
than my data center where my web server might be. So the idea is I can take advantage of referencing, in this case, a jQuery file from one of the free CDNs. Therefore, my client who comes and uses this page will be able to pull from a server that's closer to them. So in this case, I'm referencing jQuery. So if we look traditionally, I would have done this. I would have the jQuery file hosted directly within my own site. Instead, I can take advantage of one of the free CDNs, in this case Microsoft, to serve that jQuery file, which is great. So I don't need to use my own bandwidth, and it's going to serve closer to my customer, so it should be faster. Let's take a look at what this page will do. If it works properly, we'll see that it will run the ready function and show an alert that the ready function was run properly. And it does what we expect. The jQuery was downloaded OK, therefore the ready function ran, and it did the alert as we would expect. When we look in Fiddler, then, we can see that the request actually went to ajaxmicrosoft.com, and everything was working fine. So if we want to simulate a failure of that, I can drag that to autoresponder, enable the rules, and tell this to return a 404. Now if we go back and look at what will happen in the web page, we anticipate that this could fail, so we actually have some fallback content here. So in the case that jQuery is not defined after attempting to download it from that site, it will actually serve again locally. So we get the best of both worlds. While the CDN is available, it'll serve from a CDN server closer to the customer. In the case where that fails for some reason, this code will kick in and say, I'm going to actually pull it from my origin web server instead, but at least it'll function. So let's see how that behaves for that test. So if we go back to Chrome, we hit Control F5, we'll see that the ready function still worked. When we go back into Fiddler, we'll see that the request failed with a 404 as expected based on our rule set, but then it made the request using the normal web server and everything worked fine and we still saw the ready function. So again, autoresponder gives us the capability to tweak specific responses. So in this case, we can cause a failure to occur and see that our fallback content is working properly. So the person using the page experiences exactly what we'd expect, but we know and have had a good way to test that the fallback works like we expected. We've seen some great examples of autoresponder in Fiddler. If you're interested in learning about other features in Fiddler, I have a couple Pluralsight courses on the topic. The most recent one is debugging your website with Fiddler and Chrome DevTools. And the idea in this course is you have specific issues on your website, the styles aren't working, JavaScript isn't working, you have performance issues, etc. You can use this and it takes the approach of the particular problem and pick which tool is appropriate and walk you through how to troubleshoot and discover what's wrong with your site. My other course is just Fiddler and it takes a more feature specific look at all the portions of Fiddler and how you can use them effectively. So if you want to see all of the major features of Fiddler and how you might take advantage of them, you can look, take a look at this course as well.